Welcome. I'm Candace Turtle. I'm a board member with the Ashen Climate Collaborative and your moderator for this discussion on the Federal Inflation Reduction Act and the financial incentives for businesses and organizations for energy upgrades. Um, the presentation today will also cover workforce development incentives. Um, this meeting is being recorded for those who can't attend. Please type your questions into the chat as they occur to you. And we're gonna monitor the chat room as, they, um, as we go through the afternoon. And um, after the presentation, we'll be taking those questions and answers uh, right from the chat. So today's webinar is brought to you by the all-volunteer Electrify Ashland Now Action Team of the Ashland Climate Collaborative. And as I think many of you know, ACC is a hub for community collaboration to reduce our climate footprint and um, to build a more equitable and resilient Ashland. And you can learn more about the collaborative and about Electrify Ashland Now's team at ashlandclimate.org. We also have action teams that are working on transportation <laughs> issues, particularly around biking. Um, we have food composting and water conservation teams as well. And information about all of these teams is linked through ashlandclimate.org. And now you can visit us um, when we table outside of the Ashland Food Co-op on two Thursdays each month. So now let's get right to today's presenter. Joel Rosenberg is part of the special projects team at Rewiring America. He is an educator and entrepreneur um, focused on helping solve the climate crisis for his elementary age school daughter, his amazing partner, and the future of everyone on the planet. Joel has worked on science and engineering education, especially on how to teach about engineering, or excuse me, on energy systems. And he's done this at the Museum of Science um, in Boston, the Karls Ruhl Institute of Technology in Germany, the Lawrence Hall of Sciences at UC Berkeley, where I have spent many a wonderful hour, as well, at, as well as at Maker Media and other lab. Joel is also the co-founder of 3D Fab Light, an industrial laser cutting company. Joel has a mechanical engineering degree from MIT and a master's from Columbia's Graduate School of Journalism. Um, welcome, Joel, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you for um, that introduction. Thank you're you for having well, me. You're welcome. I would also ask, I think someone's got their speaker on and maybe they could um, hit mute just so we don't have any background feeding off of everything. Thanks. Okay, Joel, take it away. Okay, great. So can you see my screen? First yes. Question. Okay, great. And then, uh, <clears throat> Okay, thanks for having me. Um, this is a talk about the Inflation Reduction Act. I'm calling it uh, what the IRA means for Ashland and everywhere because you know uh, it's applicable across the United States. Uh, it's going to be a bit of a fire hose, and I will do my best to help navigate it. But it is in a, a huge bill, and there's really a lot in there. And um, and a lot of our focus at Rewiring America has been on. Um, on the household. And so I'm going to try and give you a sense of what the business and nonprofit, uh, including schools and libraries, uh, lay of the land is, but it's a lot. And so I'm warning you ahead of time. I will start by saying um, the reason we want to electrify everything is that if we can get clean electricity, and it's pretty clean up by you guys, uh, and we use that clean electricity from wind and solar and hydro to run everything if it's all electric, then we could stop burning fossil fuels and essentially solve climate change. And so that's the motivation behind Electrify Everything. And it's the reason that there's a, a bit of a time limit on how long we have to implement these changes. And uh, miraculously, we've got the Inflation Reduction Act passed by Congress last year and signed into law. And the goal is to jumpstart the electrification movement. Um, but that law is some parts of it are available now. Some parts are still being developed. Uh, guidance is coming out from the federal government. So a caveat here, not only is the following information based on our best experience of the legislative text, and we'll know more as uh, guidance comes out, but if th there's a small chance I've messed something up here, uh, we are still developing our expertise around this at Rewiring America. And so I'm going to, again, try and signpost things that are useful for different groups 
<clears throat> but if you have any questions and it doesn't come up in the chat or later, feel free to ask uh, ask Ashland, Oregon, um, Candace, or you know your, your your local organizations. They can get in touch with me. You can also email me directly, Joel at rewiringamerica.org. So with that said, I'll, I'll split it into two parts. The first will be businesses and nonprofits, and the second, which I will do, you know, sort of shorter, will be about homes or, you know, residential. So for buildings, Rewiring America, we focus on buildings because, you know, renewable power is sort of doing pretty well at growing and electric vehicles are also sort of doing pretty well. But buildings have been ignored a lot. And the Inflation Reduction Act does a lot for buildings. So for building tax credits, there are two that uh, if you're a builder of buildings, uh, there's 45L. And if you're a building owner, there's 179D. Uh, and to dig a little deeper, 45L is the new energy efficient home credit. So if you're a developer, um, you might know about this already. It's been increased by several dollars per square foot that if you build single or multifamily homes, uh, including low income housing, that you can get a bonus for each build, each unit that you build uh, if it meets either the EPA Energy Star or the DOE Zero Energy Ready Homes standard. And if you use a prevailing wage for multifamily buildings, it can multiply by five times for each unit. So that means if you build single family home to one of these standards, you can get either 2,500 or five grand. If you build a multifamily building, you can get either 500 or 2,500 to one standard or 1,000 to 5,000 uh, with prevailing wage for, um, for, the build for the units that you're building. Um, we also, I was told today that there are deep energy, re deep retrofits can also be eligible. We don't actually know what that means, but if you are a developer on this call or you know developers, you can make them aware that perhaps retrofits will also be included as part of this credit. And it's based on, it's based on meeting these standards. Um, if you own a building, whether you're a business or you're a commercial entity or nonprofits as well, um, you can, uh, again, tax exempt, you can transfer this deduction to the property designer, the person who's, we're not exactly sure what property designer means, but, um, but this is something to investigate. So if you own a building, commercial building, uh, there's also a per square foot deduction for improving the energy use of your building. Uh, so what does that mean? That means that, you know, the total amount of energy that you use over the course of a year divided by your square footage is sometimes referred to as your energy use intensity. Okay. And it's just a, it's like a, the miles per gallon for your building, except it's like how much energy does your building use per square foot? If you can reduce your usage by 25%, you're eligible for uh, a 50 cent per square foot uh benefit without prevailing wage. And then it's capped at 2,500. Uh, I think it's two, I think $2,500 is wrong. I think that's supposed to be five bucks per square foot. Yeah, that's right. If you, if you get up to a 50% reduction in your EUI, that's like, again, your MPG for the building, you can get up to $1 per square foot. Uh, if just, just by doing that reduction, if you use prevailing wage, it could be up to five bucks per square foot. I think up to a quarter million dollars. Okay, so building owners, here's a big incentive to get your energy use down because the government's just going to pay you for that. And for residential buildings, it's four stories or more for multifamily. Um, feel free to interrupt me. You know, I'm just trying to just trying to get you guys aware of what's out there. Okay, commercial for EVs and charging infrastructure. There's this thing called 30C, which is for the charging infrastructure. It'll do up to 30% tax credits if you're in a rural or low-income community. I'm not sure if Ashland qualifies as rural. And, yes, and where... we do. Oh, so you're so okay. So for commercial uh, charger in infrastructure, uh, the the incentive can be up to hundred thousand dollars per property. I'm not sure what the details of that are, but like that's there's a significant amount of money available. Again, it's a 30% tax credit for doing EV charging in a rural area. And then for the vehicles themselves, there's this, it's called 45W. Again, I apologize for the like legalese aspect, but that's how it's referred to in the policy circles. It's essentially a clean vehicle tax credit where if you get a regular un, you know, car under 14,000 pounds, I think, or gross weight vehicle weight rating, 
not exactly sure what that means, but you can get 7,500 bucks, which is very similar to what the consumer uh, EV tax credit is. But if you get a larger vehicle than that, which includes school buses, it includes trucks, it can include like library, um, um, what do you call it? Like if you have a, a library. A bookmobile. bookmobile. That's right. If you have a book, the <laughs> bookmobile. So you can potentially get up to 40 grand off of those larger vehicles. So these are significant amounts of money when you're trying to go electric. And for 45W, unlike the, the uh, consumer EV tax credit, there we, there are no uh, sourcing manufacturing assembly requirements. Okay. There are a number of financing options and grants uh, that are coming as part of the Inflation Reduction Act. One to be aware of for, you know, for people on this call is the Greenhouse Reduction Fund, sometimes called the Accelerator. It's $27 billion meant to leverage private capital with around a five to one ratio. So for every dollar loaned, it, the bank or you know, credit union can lend out $5. And it's split into these two pots. The first is $7 billion for residential and community solar and storage in low income and disadvantaged communities. And the other $20 billion is going to be distributed to these community development financial institutions, these CDFIs or green banks and things like that, to be able to do home electrification and other kinds of things. And $8 billion of that 20 is reserved for low income and disadvantaged communities. So that money is coming down the pipe, whether it's residential and community solar in low income areas, or it's, um, you know, there's $12 billion for non-low income areas that's going to be distributed through this like grant programs where the federal government's going to seed other programs and banks that's going to potentially seed other ones that's going to distribute the money. That's a lot of money if you have projects in mind. And I think that's going to be distributed through, again, these, these local nonprofits. And then I'll just quickly mention that the Loan Programs Office, if you've heard of that, it's now run by Jigger Shaw. It used to be, uh, if you've heard of like the Solyndra controversy from, you know, the previous you know, solar failures, and the Republicans like to harp on that. Um, this is the loan programs office. They're they're now led by a guy who is very talented at lending money, and, and he used to run a, a private equity kind of uh, company for for clean energy. They have a a lot of money, three point six billion to facilitate forty billion in loans for increasing manufacturing and recycling here of the materials that we need. And then another $5 billion that's going to be guaranteed for $250 billion in loans. And that's to increase our, to upgrade our outdated energy infrastructure. So that's going to include virtual power plants. It's going to include home electrification, demand response, et cetera. So there's a lot of money coming there. That's Those are bigger numbers and, and that's not available to, you know, everyday business owners. But these are just things to be aware of that if there's money flowing in towards, uh, you know, electrification type projects that it's another source and then i'll just mention the defense production act which is half a billion dollars meant to try and get manufacturers building stuff here in america heat pumps things like that okay manufacturing incentives so what this maybe that's mislabeled it's basically the the clean energy tax credits for doing things for solar wind battery storage and geothermal um, it's sometimes called the investment tax credit or the production tax credit. Basically, investment tax credit means that you can get a 30% tax credit on solar and wind and geothermal stuff. And production tax credit, you can, instead of the investment tax credit, as I understand it, you could opt for getting the money like on your solar as it produces the power. I think a lot of people pick the investment tax credit. If you are a nonprofit, they, it is enabled for direct pay, which means that you don't have, you know, tax exempt places don't have tax to deduct, but now you're going to be able to get the money transferred to who you're buying it from. So a lot of uh, schools in particular were doing these power purchase agreements where a private company would put solar on the school and they would own it because they have tax liability. And then the school would just buy the um, the solar power. But now it it's going to start to make sense for the school to own it and to not have that third party uh, involved because, it's going to, because they're going to be able to access that money directly. And then there are a couple of adders so it could potentially go up to 70% for solar if it's in, uh, you know, there's a there's a bonus for domestic content. There's a bonus for uh, um, prevailing wage. And there's another bonus for low-income communities. So for solar, 
you know, schools might be able to get solar if they're low income area for 60 to 7. We're not sure if it's 60 percent or 70 percent, but potentially 60 to 70 percent off of the cost of solar. Um, so it's a lot of money. And the bonuses are stackable. OK, I'm going to just mention these things. I don't know too much about them, but the, but just for the sake of completeness, uh, if you happen to work on subsidized housing, there's uh, this program. It used to be known as GREAT, G-R-E-A-H-T, which is an OK acronym. Um, essentially, it's going to be a billion dollars to try and help you know, leverage up to $4 billion of loans for improvements to affordable housing. And I believe that's going to be administered by HUD, by Housing and Urban Development. And um, and then there's also going to be another billion dollars to help uh, states and local governments improve their adoption of better building codes. So the latest and zero energy residential and building code. So if that's your thing, if you have involvement from a government point of view on code adoption, there's going to be money to try and ratchet up the codes. Um, uh, for workforce and labor incentives, uh, the, there's a contractor training grant. There's $200 million that's going to come through the states that's going to try and train contractors on energy efficiency and electrification upgrades. Um, contractor incentives, uh, there these are the consumer the consumer rebates, which I'll talk about in a minute, where it's uh, meant for low and moderate income households, either uh, upgrading the stuff itself, getting electric equipment, or upgrading the house to reduce your energy bill, kind of like what I was saying about reducing your EUI by 25%. There's going to be incentives for contractors. We think it's going to probably be per house, oops, um, 500 bucks if you're going to replace, up to 500 bucks if you're going to replace somebody's heat pump in a low income area, and up to 200 bucks if you're going to help reduce their overall energy use in disadvantaged communities. So if you're a contractor, you know somebody, that's an incentive to pay attention to. And then I'm not going to read this list, but a lot of the incentives have a prevailing wage adder to try and get labor, um, you know, unionized labor uh, uh, kinds of things, uh, kinds of entities helping to make this transition and that we pay better because it's subsidized by the federal government. It's kind of the idea. All right, a couple other ones. I know it's like a deluge. I apologize again. I'm just trying to I'm just trying to signpost what's in there and like maybe people's ears are pricking up when they hear something that might be relevant to them. All of it probably needs more investigation, but I'm just giving you the lay of the land. It's a lot. Okay. So uh, if you are a small business that has access to the R&D tax credit, it is being doubled. Um, there are transportation grants for clean, heavy duty vehicles, including um, buses and things like that. And then you guys aren't near a port, but there is a lot of money available for cleaning up ports. And then finally here, there's the environmental and climate justice block grants where they're just going to try and get uh, money out to, you know, through local governments and tribes and community nonprofits to, um, to just work on infrastructure and workforce development. So th these are more, I think it's more general, just trying to, you know, help the transition along by getting more money to the group, to the areas that need it most. All right, and then I, I'm going to add these two slides. One is schools, because I, I spent a good chunk of last year looking into electrifying schools and what that might take. Um, for new construction schools, there's basically no cost premium to make them all electric. You just have to specify it in the RFP. So if you guys are building any schools, that's something to know about. For retrofitting schools, it's something that absolutely schools should be looking into, but there are way fewer examples of retrofit schools. That said, uh, the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, also known as the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, includes a bunch of money for energy improvements as well as electric school buses. And so I produced this booklet called uh, Electrify Everything in Your School Handbook, which is you can download. And again, the slides will have all of these links. And then if you work with schools, there's these two other documents produced by this group called This is Planet Ed. And uh, they go into more detail about what's available. It's sort of based on what some of the things that I've talked about before, like direct pay for nonprofits for solar storage and geothermal heat pumps, or the commercial clean vehicle tax credit. So you could take that 40 grand on a school bus instead of like a, you know, a, a dump truck or something. Um, and the same for the charging station and the same for making the schools more efficient. Okay. <clears throat> and then I will 
also add that uh, I was alerted recently to these two webinars by the American Library Association, which talk about $50 million energy retrofit grants from the Department of Energy, as well as the clean energy tax credits, many of which I've spoken about previously. What's nice about these is that they are focused on libraries because that's the audience, but it applies more generally to nonprofits and other you know, non-tax paying entities. So if you fall into that category, you can check out these videos. Okay, and then I was told earlier that uh, a lot of focus has already been put on consumers. So I'll go through this quickly, but for those of you who are homeowners or as well as renters, um, oops, there's like five main areas to know about. There's for lower in, low and moderate income, there's these electrification rebates and energy efficiency rebates. Uh, and then for everybody, there's these tax credits uh, for, electric, for electric and efficient appliances, for solar and storage, and for EVs. The, um, the low and moderate income ones are still in development, and they we hope that they will be available later this year or very early next year. <clears throat> and the rest of them are available now. So to give you a sense of those low and moderate income ones, they're, they're, the, the goal is for there to be point of sale rebates for low and moderate income people low and moderate income it's like uh, to to flip the way that we think about that or those think the way it's defined low income is defined as 80% of the area median income which means if you make eight, less than 80% of what the people in your you know me area which is like zip code based or census tract based then you can get up to 100% of these electric appliances paid for and if you make between 80 and 150% of that area median income then you can get up to 50% of that cost paid for. So, um, so you know, if you're if you fall in that under 80% AMI, you could get up to eight grand for an H for for a heat pump, completely paid for if the cost is under eight grand. Or if you're in that middle income, and your heat pump costs 12 grand, you can get up to 50% you know, up to eight grand off of that. So instead, of, so if it costs 12 grand, you would get six six grand paid for. And then you could take the tax credit on that six grand, right? So it's a little confusing. It's coming later this year, low and moderate income. There's also these efficiency rebates, same kind of idea that I was saying before, that if you reduce the energy use of your building, of your house, then you can get some of that paid for. Um, for under 80% AMI, it's up to eight grand. Uh, and up for everybody else, it's up to four grand. And then modeled versus measured basically just means like if it's, uh, if I think modeled is for new construction, meaning like the, uh, I'm not 100%, I'm not 100% sure about this slide. I copied it from somebody else. <laughs> Ask me questions if you have questions about the efficiency rebates. And they're coming late 2023. Um, for the consumer tax credits, uh, this is for stuff like heat pumps, uh, heat pump water heaters, um, insulation, weatherization, doors and windows electrical panel upgrades. Um, you can get up to two grand for the heat pumps and heat pump water heaters. And that's as a tax credit up to 30% up to $2,000. And for those other things, including a um, an, an energy audit, and somebody on here is an energy auditor, uh, up to $150 or 30% up to 150 bucks for an energy audit. So these are things you have to pay for up front, and then you can claim on your taxes. Unfortunately, they're not refundable, which means that if you don't owe as much taxes as you would get back, the lowest you can go is zero. They're not going to send you a refund for more than you uh, than you would have owed. And so unfortunately, it still skews towards wealthier people who make more money and owe more taxes. But for everybody, you know, you can and these things reset every year. So you could potentially do a two thousand dollar tax credit on a heat pump one year. And then if you've got another heat pump the next year or heat pump water heater, you could get another $2,000 tax credit. Or if you do you know, five grand worth of weatherization on your house one year, you could get $1,200 back that year. If you do another five grand the next year, you can get another 1,200 bucks back. And that's good for the next 10 years. And there's an FAQ from the IRS, which is you know the best we have so far. There's also tax credits. This, this existed before, um, but for solar and storage, as well as geothermal heat pumps, 30%, it's not capped. So if you pay 30 grand for solar panels and a battery, you can get 10 grand of that, plus or you know, a little less than 10 grand of that 
back as a tax credit. Um, and it covers purchase and installation. It's not refundable. Again, like you can't you can't get the 10 grand back if you owe less than 10 grand. You can get up to as much as you owe, but you can apparently carry it forward to future years. And uh, I have a little asterisk here because it does apply to community solar, um, both ownership, if you own a piece of the community solar, or if you're a subscriber, because the developer of the community solar farm could take an investment tax credit. Okay, electric vehicles, There's, this has been in the news, people probably heard about this, where it is a, a little income and uh, MSRP limited based on how much they charge. And there are a couple other requirements of like the battery size, et cetera. Um, and starting in 2024, it will turn into a point of sale rebate where you can go to the dealer and transfer the money to them and they should do directly deduct it from what you owe. But for new vehicles, for new EVs, you get up to 7,500 bucks uh, off if it meets certain requirements. There is no longer a cap on the manufacturer. So Tesla was not eligible for them prior to the a, uh, to the uh, IRA, but that has been removed. And so they are eligible again. Uh, and you can check out this IRS website on the details. And then there's also a credit for used EVs. So that's up to four grand only through dealers. And it has similar kinds of income and MSRP requirements. And then you guys live in a rural area. And so... Um, you are potentially eligible for up to 30%, a 30% tax credit up to $1,000 per charger for EV, for level two EV chargers, as they're known. Those are the faster ones. Level one comes with your car and it plugs into a regular wall outlet. Level two is you get a little box that runs on 240 volts and you're eligible for a rebate on that. And then renters, I mean, it's pretty great. If you are a renter, uh, you could take advantage of many of these things that I'm talking about. Um, particularly, you know, EVs, or if you get an induction stove, maybe I, I'm a renter and I have an, a little portable uh, induction burner that sits on top of my gas regular rental stove. Um, heat pump clothes dryers, some of those are portable, plug in 120 volt outlets. And I also have a, a window unit. It's essentially a portable air conditioner that can turn into a heat pump in the winter. And so I paid I don't know, 700 bucks for it. And it works now all year. So right now I'm using it in uh, my partner's room to keep her warm. So I don't have to turn on our central natural gas heat here. And then in the summer, I'm going to move it to this room and keep cool while she stays hot. And so that's a way to avoid central air and avoid central heat using just a portable heat pump unit. And then I mentioned great before, but like uh, as a renter, affordable housing, uh, these, these, uh, this uh, money that's going to help build affordable, efficient housing will should benefit uh, the people who are living in them uh, because they'll just be lower bills. And if you are, again, a developer, it does stack with the low-income uh, tax credit. So you can build efficient, affordable housing um, by stacking those benefits. Okay, I'm in the end game now. Uh, some of you have seen this, but uh, I think uh, Candace is going to send out this link again. There, we have a calculator where the things I was talking about, based on area median income and you know, and, and your uh, where your zip code, it will tell you what you should be eligible for. We don't guarantee it, but we think we're doing pretty well um, at giving you a sense of what is available. And I already explained area median income, so I'll skip that. We also have this Go Electric guide, which uh, has a couple of case studies to try and give you a sense of how you might plan taking advantage of these uh, rebates and tax credits over the next 10 years. And we have three different case studies that are four different case studies for low, middle, quote unquote, high income, and then uh, uh, renters. Uh, and in the back of that guide, there's a page that says your plan that gives a, a table that shows, you know, who, what appliances are eligible for which rebates uh, from the IRA. But it has a little space for you to print this out and fill in the year that you might want to take advantage of each rebate or tax credit. And I'm about to do that um, to try and get a sense of, of how uh, we might take advantage of it. And then finally, there's this, well, almost finally, there's this guide that I wrote in 2021 uh, before the Inflation Reduction Act passed that tries to lay out what are the appliances that you need to replace? What are some of the questions that you might want to ask your contractor so that you can be a good client? Um, and for each item in this list, in addition to trying uh, to have a suggestion for what renters can do, it also has a do now suggestion. 
And I should say that, you know, these apply to the home where it's like, oh, go for an EV test drive or call a contractor and get a quote for a heat pump or a few quotes for a heat pump or get an energy audit, et cetera. But the same idea, I haven't done it for these commercial um, rebates, but like the more planning that you can do into what what is available now and what's coming up that's going to be available, uh, who are the contractors who might be able to do this work for me? The more planning you can do, the better position you will be to take advantage of all of the tax credits. And the longer you put it off, the less likely it is that you're going to act on it. And I should also say that a lot of the replacements in your home are done in an emergency situation, particularly around you know heating, cooling, and hot water. And so if you've called a couple of contractors and gotten a couple of quotes, then, and maybe even gotten an outlet installed, uh, then when your appliance dies, you're just ready to upgrade and you won't get caught uh, in a unfortunate situation. And you know, from a commercial point of view, I, I just was reading an article this morning about uh, in LA, the natural gas bills have just completely spiked from a dollar a therm to 350 a therm. And these restaurants that cook with natural gas are like facing, you know, $10,000 gas bills. So again, it's like, you, you, we should start planning for our electric future. And the more of that you can do as a business owner, as a nonprofit, uh, you know, owner, whatever you call it, runner, or as a homeowner, or even a renter, the better off you'll be. Um, I will say that uh, the, the Go Electric Guide and the Electrify Everything in Your Home Guide are kind of mapped one to one. So you could you could sort of go through this list in your plan and then check each chapter in the book. And then we have a couple of fact sheets. I'll, I'll see if I can find the thing and put the put these all in the chat. But we have something about the rebate programs, about the tax credits, and we also have a, a sort of a contractor um, guide if you know any contractors. Okay, I have inundated you with information. It was just a barrage and I apologize, <laughs> but hopefully um, that was helpful. I'm not an expert on some of this stuff, so I'm happy to, I'm gonna stop sharing. Again, email me, joel at rewiringamerica.org. I'm going to stop sharing and I'm happy to answer as many questions as I can. If anything I can't answer or if any of my answers or presentation was unsatisfactory, feel free to email me. <laughs> and um, it's a lot, it's a lot, it really is a lot. But as we were talking about before the call started, it really is up to everybody you know, both from their business point of view and from their homeowner or rental point of view to do what you can somewhat as quickly as you can. I mean, at Rewiring America, we say like, okay, you don't have to replace stuff before it's end of life, but you should definitely plan to not accidentally be in an emergency situation where you have to replace it and lock in another 10 to 25 years of fossil fuel burning because you didn't make a plan. Right. And, um, and it runs, you know, the solution to climate change it's not plastic straws. It's not, those are fine. It runs through everybody's garage and everybody's basement and everybody's business. And we've been given money to try and help make it done. And it's now our duty to take advantage of that and to make the IRA a success and to make climate change uh, a failure. Thank you so much, Joel. We really appreciate it. You warned us it would be a little bit like drinking from a fire hose and it is, but I think your message of making sure uh, that uh, we have a plan and we can just get a start is really important. And the message that we want to give everybody here tonight also is that that's the purpose of the Ashland Climate Collaborative is we're here to be your partner, to help you so you don't have to feel overwhelmed and you don't have to feel alone. One step at a time, um, we, can, we can get there. Um, Lori has been very kindly putting a lot of interesting links into the chat room to help you with these. And I also wanted to say, it's so exciting for us to meet the author of, Rew of, of Electrify Everything. We are big fans of that uh, brochure pamphlet booklet and tout it almost every single time we have a webinar. So it's my hat goes off to you. You've done a really excellent job on that, Joel. Thank you. Yeah, so, I'm putting. So, the, I'm sorry. I put yeah. the links to the calculator and to the guide and the home guide and the fact sheets into the chat. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Lori's going to help us with the uh, questions. And everybody, this is your chance. This is this is your expert. 
uh, put those questions in the chat. There's no silly question out there. We want to hear it all. Take it away, Lori. All right, Candice, thank you. And Joel, yeah, I kind of want an autograph copy, you know, of those books. So next time I go to Maryland, I'm going to get you to sign my books for me. Sure. So great job. Um, so a couple of questions about churches. Uh, can you talk about the paperwork that nonprofits like churches need to fill out to get the tax credit? And I think a lot of people are like, wow, like churches, we can get this done in our church. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So I don't know um, what my under so uh, what do I want to say that depending on what you want to claim, essentially uh, our best understanding, it depends which tax, you know, which tax credits you're talking about, like mm -hmm. for, I believe just for buying stuff that if, you know, your receipts will be enough and that it's going to just end up being a, another thing on i mean to be perfectly honest i don't even know what nonprofits file as their taxes oh you know? we have a thing called the 990 it's 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 a regular organizational tax return but special for nonprofits but, okay so, so there will sure so there'll probably just be another form this year just like you know all the forms that are part of uh, you doing your taxes and it'll just show up in turbo tax or whatever and it'll be like did you buy a heat pump this year uh etc and it will try and help you claim those things. And then from a receipts point of view, you probably won't have to submit the documentation, but you know, get for everything, our general advice is to get at least three quotes from contractors uh, and ask them questions. They work for you. Uh, this is whether it's your home or your church or your school or whatever. Um, just ask around, look, you know, try and get more input and, and document it. And so I don't think that this, for, for something like the reduction in uh, your energy use, I'm not sure exactly the details of that, but if that's something you're interested in pursuing, the people who are going to help you do that work should be boning up on this now. And if they don't know, they can contact us. Maybe I, I'm not 100% sure what the, what the state of the guidelines are. You know, uh, we are actively pursuing. Uh, one of the reasons I'm on the special projects team and it's not our policy team. Uh, is more well versed in the law itself, but they're also very, very busy writing the responses to the requests for information from the federal government as they develop Ooh. the guidelines. Mm -hmm. So I'm here as like your representative of our policy team. Um, but, you know, if you go down the road and you're like, oh, we, we're not sure what we need in order to claim this credit, absolutely reach out and we could try and we'll, we're, this whole thing is going to be like debugging in real time mm -hmm. with you know, your local, your state and your federal governments uh, helping to try and bring this into existence. So I'm mm -hmm. not sure that's a long way of saying, and that's probably the answer to a lot of these things. I don't know the details of what you need to claim. If you do this, if you like, you know, dot the I's and cross the T's on getting energy improvements and efficient machine upgrades to your business, to your businesses, to your buildings, you can feel pretty good. And I should also just caveat that by saying that there are like performance requirements for the equipment. But our general advice is like, get the best equipment that you can afford and it will probably meet the guidelines, you know? And so for heat pumps, that means quote unquote inverter driven, which is like computer controlled heat pumps, as opposed to just single stage, which means it's either on or off mm. or stage, which means it's like low, off, medium, high. Inverter driven means like, if it doesn't need full blast, it goes down to like 30%, you know, and that's much more efficient. And so if you buy that kind of equipment, which is more expensive up front, but pays itself off over a, a period of time, for something like a church, it can make sense for, you know, et cetera. <clears throat> so I guess what I'm saying is that I encourage you to get multiple quotes, try to invest more in better equipment, because that will probably meet the requirements that are being developed for performance and keep your receipts. Yeah. Hey, Joel. So this is Lori again. Um, so when you talked about the inverter driven, is that also um, the same thing as a variable speed heat pump? Because yeah, I've heard that. Speed. Is that the same thing? Yeah. yeah. So so like, yes, for, for larger buildings, it's sometimes called like VRF, which is variable refrigerant flow, which is a slightly different technology. Mm -hmm. But it's the same kind of idea of uh, um, mm -hmm. uh, being able to not just be on or off. Somebody okay. just said follow Energy Star certified products. Uh, that is good advice. 
there's another, unfortunately, they've decided to, at least for the low income stuff, they're, they're, they're going to use another, they're going to use two different standards. One will be Energy Star and the other will be from the American, from the air conditioner people, or uh, they have their own standard. Mm -hmm. And so, again, it, it, these are, it's in the weeds. Get your quotes. If you have questions about whether you think it'll be eligible, you can even email me and we can take a look. Um, Joel, I know that it's, I think that book Electrify Everything that you did was done before the IRA. So if you're like trying to find the information about the incentives, would you find that in that book or, or not? No, the incentives are mostly in that um, Go Electric guide. So that's okay. the IRA guide. Uh-huh. Okay. And so the idea was that Electrify Everything in Your Home stands up pretty well. The one thing that's missing just as an aside is like hydronic heating, which is essentially like air to water heat pumps. Mm -hmm. Um we, you can email me about that also, but uh, but then for the for the um, Inflation Reduction Act benefits, we wrote this second guide called Go Electric, that tries to lay out what the money looks like. You know, uh, electrify everything in your home is like information about the stuff. Mm -hmm, Go right. Electric is information about the money. We need both. Stuff and yeah, money. That's right, info. that's right. Right. We're all learning about this stuff. I never thought heat pumps could be so exciting. Uh, it's just an air conditioner in reverse. All yeah, that's really great analogy. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That, that can reverse, I should say. Yes, yes. We're, we're working on something. It's like, why don't buy half a machine and pay full price? Get a full machine that can both heat and cool. Right, exactly. Um, Linda Ganzini asks, uh, she said she read something from the IRS that the tax credits for 45W for eligible plug-in hybrids will be $7,000, but now I can't find the reference. This sounds like something might be hard for you to do. If you also have, uh, have that information, can you confirm and give me a reference? No. 45W <laughs> for plug-in hybrids. I mean, I don't, uh, I'm not sure what the deal is with plug-in hybrids. If I go here and I look at the clean vehicle tax credit, 45W, huh? I wonder if it's in that IRS FAQ that you referred to, which sounds kind of like, wow, I got to read that. So, um, yeah, so I could put those in the chat. So 45W, I'm not sure. So there's the IRS guidance. Hang on a second. I feel like the IRS guidance for 45, I have not seen the IRS guidance for 45w there's the here oh, hang on a second i'm gonna open the links myself to get the here oh here we go so here's the used used vehicle used vehicle and then here's the new vehicle new ev on this right this is great so, so this is the business tax credit Yes, so I'm not hybrid. sure if those links are in the business tax. Uh, those links might just be for consumer tax credits on the EVs. But there is also this other larger FAQ. Oh, but this is for this is for the at home. Well, I'll just put this in the chat anyway. This is for a residential. I'll keep looking and then I'll send it to you when I find it. Sure. I have not looked for 45W IRS guidance. So I don't know. Um, Lori, I've got a question that I'd like to ask. Um, Joel, you referred to $200 million, I'm sure that means nationally, being available to train contractors. Um, in what way, no, how would this work? Can you provide right. any details? Uh, no, I think that's also being rolled out. Uh, originally, my understanding is that that had been part of the efficiency rebates for low and moderate income. And it's now sort of its own program. Uh, what I have here, it says 200 million to states over the next 10 years for training contractors on energy efficiency or electrification upgrades, including through IRA rebate programs. So for example, in California, um, there's a program called Tech Clean California where they are providing uh, contractor rebates for heat pumps and heat pump water heaters. Uh, they also have a training program for contractors because the contractors are the ones claiming the rebates and they have to register with the state in order to be enrolled in the program and eligible for those rebates. And so you can imagine um, 
th that kind of pro that kind of training program being funded in part by this money as it's distributed. You know, two hundred million dollars is not that much money when it goes to fifty states. Right. But for another reference, there's a workforce training program in a, not a contractor training program per se, but it's like a workforce development program in uh, Maine, where Maine, like I said before, I think before the call started. Maine has been a leader in heat pump installations, in part because they don't have natural gas infrastructure up there. So everyone gets their fuels delivered, whether it's fuel oil or propane, and it's super expensive. And so uh, electric appliances are pretty efficient. They've been really pushing this. And as part of that, they enlisted the community college. They helped seed fund community college training programs for heat pump installers. And so they have a pretty robust training program. And you could imagine that being paid for as part of the contractor training grants. So like the one in California is for working contractors who want to enroll in their program. And the one in Maine is for up and coming contractors who want to learn about heat pumps. And I just use those as two examples because those are two big heat pump states that are using workforce training for different purposes, but probably can both be covered by this kind of money. And I don't know what, I don't know what that's going to look like rolling out. Okay, thank you. That that was very, um, very helpful. Um, Lori, are there any um, other questions that have come in? No, I don't I don't see any others, Candace. Um, do you want to go ahead with that idea that you had? I have an idea, yes. Um, since we have a little bit of extra time, I, I'd like to just get a um, connect with you guys here that are on the webinar. Um, if everyone can kind of put your um, your webinar view in gallery view, which is the little view um, grid up at the top, put it in gallery so you could see as many people as possible. Um, and I uh, would like to ask people um, if they've already uh, started a journey of electrifying um, or, yeah, so let's talk about, has anybody completely electrified at this point? And, you know, there's a little button at the bottom of your screen where it says reactions. If you click on that little happy face, you can raise your hand. And so everybody who has already done full electrification, raise your hand. There might be a few of us. And I, I don't see, I, I only see a couple hands. Okay, so now lower your hand. Now let's see who has started the process of looking at your equipment or maybe done a couple things. Um, raise your hand with your little icon. Oh, look at that, we got, there we go. The hands are coming up. There we go. Nice, excellent. So we've got a bunch of people that have already started it. This is great. Um, and how many, yeah, good. I still see more hands coming up, this is great. See, I think two or three years ago, this was just not a thing that was happening. So this is really big, guys. Um, and how many are thinking they'd like to start doing this in the next couple of years? Um, so if you haven't, you know, that you, you could see some opportunities now with the IRA that, that you could move forward with. Remember to take your hand down if you've already voted. Yeah. So anybody excited to get working on it? Um, and get this done over the next few years. Okay, not so many coming up, so we'll have to keep talking. <laughs> well, great, thank you for just kind of giving me some input there. Um, I think one great thing about Ashland is, you know, we've been working on this for a couple of years, so we have a really strong team in place uh, where we do a lot of hand holding for people who are trying to go through this process. And, and uh, some of our hand holders are on the call here today to answer a lot of questions and gone by and help, you know, look at people's equipment. And, um, you know, this is a really neighbor to neighbor effort. So um, thanks for people who have, you know, who are already working on this. So um, and then, yeah, go ahead. Oh, Candace, do you have a question? Um, go ahead. It's, um, Joel, I do have a question, but uh, I wanted to. I, I was you. just going to I was going to respond to a Diane, which I did in the chat there that we don't have a business guide at the moment. I had started something last year, but it's not done. And it's not I mean, things have have we, we we've been a bit swamped and we haven't focused enough on business. We do have a CEO's coalition, but it's not really geared towards um, it's mm -hmm. geared towards like helping them get their employees um interested in electrification 
Um, but you should follow us and look for stuff that comes out. You know, we're trying to con convey it and a lot of it's still a little unknown. Um, so we're working on it. And then the other part, the other thing Neil wrote, uh, not sure this makes sense to electrify fully unless one has solar and a battery. Yeah. Yes, it does make sense if you, have, it makes sense to get solar and a battery if your house is completely electric because, a, because solar will not, uh, you can island, I think not that many people do it, but with solar and a battery, you can, um, you can be resilient. And in fact, when you switch to an EV, hopefully in the next few years, your EV will be your backup battery for your home. Mm -hmm. And if you size your heat pump correctly, then it will be able to be run by your car, you know, for potentially days. But they're also working on grid scale batteries, on micro grids, where it wouldn't just be your house, it could potentially be your neighborhood. The thing is, though, I hear what you're saying. One, in a, in a power outage, your uh, natural gas a furnace isn't going to work either right. because it uses electricity for the fan and for the spark, et cetera, and for your thermostat. And the other thing is, I get it. You're concerned about being uncomfortable in the event of a grid outage. Most grid outages don't last very long. The, the reverse, the contrapositive of that is, well, I don't feel comfortable. Therefore, I will just buy my natural gas replacement so I feel better about it. But two things. One, that locks in, or a gasoline car, whatever. It locks in 20 more years of burning fossil fuels. And something that is less appreciated, uh, that we're basically maintaining two infrastructures, the electric infrastructure mm -hmm. and the natural gas infrastructure at the moment. It's going to be extremely expensive to keep supporting both of these systems. And so okay. you can imagine the day when they come to shut down the old natural gas system, because it, not only do we know we have to stop using it, but it's exorbitantly expensive. And as more people electrify, the people remaining are like, this is getting mm -hmm. insane. And right. like, that's kind of what I was saying before. So there's a social aspect to it also. And, you know, I get it. You don't want to be uncomfortable, but, you know, and I don't want to like say, you know, oh, well, cavemen lived in, in caves with a little bit of fire for generations. We don't want to go back to that, but it's a pretty low risk to upgrade your stuff to electric. And the opposite, the reverse is like, you guys lived through that heat wave that had never happened before, right? It's just going to keep getting worse. We have a chance to try and stop making the problem worse. And I get it. Everybody's like, but what about me? Yes. What about me? But what about us? Yeah. Like, let's yeah. just fix the problem. And, yeah. and as we fix the problem, your personal concerns will be alleviated. Mm -hmm. But if you don't fix the problem by worrying about everybody, you're going to end up in the same problem. Yeah. And I will also say that um, I have seen Thomas McBartlett III, who runs Ashland's electric utility. We own our own electric utility in Ashland, which is really super. It allows us to manage and come up with creative ideas like how do we how do we help finance people who are swapping out of gas into electric? And um uh, our, our utility has won awards for having such a low number of um, power outage situations and also coming back um, quickly. And um, I will say that during the recent fire that we had in Talent in Phoenix, you know, having gas wasn't a, you know, wasn't a great option there either, and that it's hard to um, recover from some natural situations with, with gas also. Um, and the question that I had was you had talked about that there was uh, money available for code adoption. So is that available to cities that or planning departments that are thinking, how do we help people? Um, how can we write clear codes and whatnot and give people the information they need to decide um, when they're going to build a development or a new home or something like that? Yeah. So my understanding is that that is that it says here money is going to be administered to state and local governments, and the purpose is to adopt and enforce latest low, you know, zero energy type codes. And so I don't think I don't know how much it is like writing your own code as much as like trying to ease the adoption of model codes that are already pushing the envelope. You know what I mean? Like there there is a code uh, writing system in the United States that is adopted locally, sort of city by city. And I think part of this is to try and help accelerate the modernization of the codes. You know, there's lots of, there's lots of improvements to be made that, but because 
you know, to be perfectly honest, in America, both for our appliances and for our building codes, it's sort of like minimum requirements. And it is difficult politically to ratchet up those codes. And this is trying to incentivize that. Um, I'm not sure of the details and I don't really work on codes, but I do know that like, you, you know, you hear about cities adopting model codes and, and you know, gas bans and stuff like that. And um, I think that's what it's intended for. If you're, full, if you're working with the local government, then that's something to pay attention to um, because it is a city by, I believe it's city by city code adoption, you know, and it's like, it's influenced by the state, but, and I'm not a hundred percent sure of how that hierarchy works, but I think that's what it's meant to do is to like make it hard. Like, you know, if you think about the problem, the problem is that we want fossil fuels to be expensive and difficult, and we want electricity to be cheap and easy. And so if we have codes that are like, Hey, this is what you have to do. People follow it because they, they need the certificate of occupancy. Or, you know, like, they're like, well, it's more expensive, but then everybody does it and it gets cheaper. And like, so we face this chicken and egg. And the idea here is like, hey, everybody, like, just pull it together. We know what to do. We just have to do it. And there's like so much foot, feet dragging that the Inflation Reduction Act is this, you know, it's not enough money, but it's the most money we've ever gotten. And sort of a catalyst. Again, like said, yeah. So it's like a miracle that we got this big infusion at this moment of, you know, this, this uh, crossroads. And uh, it's like, hey, let's make it happen. It's up to us now. We have 10 years of this. Let's transform in the next 10 years. And so that, you know, codes, contractor training, homeowner rebates, construction, efficiency rebates, tax credits, lots of money. We basically said, forget the carbon tax. Would have been great, but it would have been effective. Nobody would have liked it. And so we didn't do it. Now we're like, okay, let's just throw money at everybody and go with the American like consumerism and improve and upgraded stuff. <clears throat> and we'll see if that works. All right, I have another quick question. Um, you mentioned that there was $20 billion for green banks. And I wondered if you might just take a moment to explain kind of what you think that phrase means in this context and any other information you might have about it. So I, um, hang on, let me see what it says here in the notes. Um, so what one of our policy people wrote on this slide is uh, grants to community development financial institutions. I think those are like yeah. credit unions potentially or green bank like entities. So these can be nonprofits. These could potentially be community organizations, et cetera, that are trying to that have that have private capital available and it's like trying to secure loans to make projects happen so for example you could imagine you know uh a a, a low-income development trying to electrify and be more efficient because it just makes sense to have people who are energy burdened get much more efficient appliances uh that make their operating costs much lower and maybe they can even potentially pay it back from their energy savings, but they need some private capital for the upfront cost, that kind of thing. Or, you know, the schools want to electrify. And so, you know, they take out, they do bonds, but they also take out loans and do leases and stuff. Some private capital to help with upfront costs might be able to, um, you know, grease the wheel on getting over that first cost and then, um, and then reaping the rewards after that. And that I think is a large part of what it's trying to do. I don't have a better definition of CDFIs or green bank like entities other than they are organizations focused on leveraging capital to decarbonize. Thank you. And and I see that Court Smith um, has uh, asked something that's very interesting. Um, Court says, not many people indicated uh, that they wanted to start electrification, um, although I know a lot of people had started so um, some participants had started could people indicate the barriers to do more electrification um, what's holding what's holding you back from doing it is I think the question Lori do you want to run that poll with our remaining um, guests well yeah uh, well or people could just put it in the chat there might be a variety of answers I'm thinking. yeah I would I would love to see in the chat um, mm -hmm. what what assistance would you need? Is it 
expertise? Is it financial? Is it, um, uh, I don't know, what do, you, what do you have beyond those two things which are pretty, um, pretty crucial? Or, or not yet convinced um, that uh, it yeah. makes sense? Yes. Or that the appliance, the the performance would be as good uh, with the electric options as as what you're used to, or concerns about grid the grid going down as we talked about earlier, um, it could be yeah. one of a number of things. Maybe you just don't have time to think about this, but you're here, so this is good. This is a good start. Yeah. It's a good start. Yeah, and, and also I think um, even after the program, you could um, tell us how we might be able to help continue the conversation, especially uh, we've done a lot of work for resident, uh, more work on residential, as we said earlier, and we would really love to, to, you know, provide more support to the business community to, um, to help you navigate this. And while people are maybe thinking about what they'd like to put into the chat, I wanted to let everyone know this is being recorded, as I mentioned at the beginning of the um, presentation, and we are going to send a link to this uh, recording to everyone who registered. We had a lot of people register, and uh, we will also link it from our website. And uh, it's it's there's a lot of information here, so it'll be great if you need to um, go back and review that. Um, I am not seeing anything in the chat. Um, Lori, are you seeing anything? No. Okay. No. Feel free to reach out to us. We'd, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and I want to, oh, here we go. Uh, financial barriers. Barrier is financial. Yeah. We have to replace much of our heat pump system just to replace our backup gas heat source to all electric, mm. said, said somebody. Yeah. And we're hoping that some of this um, Inflation Reduction Act, the financial incentives will, will help. Yeah, okay, great. Um, I wanna thank everybody for taking the time out of your busy day to join us. Um, and we hope that we have left you some useful information and you feel a little bit more empowered to take some steps toward creating a plan to avoid reducing your um, emissions through electrification. And as we mentioned, there are lots of resources um, through rewiringamerica.org, as well as Electrify Ashland. And you can always email us at info at ashlandclimate.org. And um, I'd like to say, if you um, find these discussions valuable, please support ACC with a donation of any amount so that we can continue to offer these free community discussions. And you can do this easily through our donate button on our website. And I just wanted to say one more time, thank you so much to Joel and Rewiring America for being here, for the work that you're doing, the wonderful documents and interactive calculators that you are creating. We really, really appreciate you. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for your gift of time and talent. And we can do this. We can do it. Make it happen, everybody. Thank All you right. for having me. Thanks for paying attention. And good luck. And, and keep me posted. I look forward to the amazing progress from Ashland. Yeah, there you go. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye, everybody.